Welcome to today's video. I'm Richard Chapo. I'm an internet lawyer down in San Diego, California. And today we're talking about the California Consumer Privacy Act and mandatory arbitration. Uh, so the California Consumer Privacy Act, it's a new uh, California privacy law, obviously. It goes into effect January 1st, 2020. It's also referred to as the CCPA. Now, um, the CCPA is unique in that it's going to create a lot of new uh, rights for consumers and businesses are going to have to respond uh, to those rights. And uh, the days of slapping up a privacy policy on your website or app and forgetting about it, well, that's going to end on January 1st, 2020. So uh, a lot of people are paying attention to the CCPA as they try to figure out how to comply with it and, uh, you know, other factors. And in looking at the law closely, uh, many of us, particularly those of us who are lawyers, are recognizing that the law has a lot of problems, <laughs> uh, specifically in the area of uh, ambiguities and conflicts. And so the issue with mandatory arbitration uh, is a potential major conflict that could have serious consequences for the CCPA. So uh, just a real quick refresher on arbitrations versus trials. Uh, when a consumer has a dispute with a business, they want to go to trial. They want to take it to trial because um, they want to have a jury of their peers, hear the evidence in the case, and then make a decision. And that's going typically going to be more favorable to a consumer than a business uh, because issues like emotion will be involved. A jury is going to be sympathetic to somebody who's uh, physically injured, um, you know, those kinds of things. Now, a business in general is going to want to send any kind of dispute with consumers to arbitration. And the reason for that is an arbitration is not heard by a jury of your peers. It is typically uh, going to be heard by uh, one to three arbitrators, usually one. And that person is either going to be uh, typically a retired judge or perhaps an attorney who specializes in the field of the dispute. So if you have a dispute, for instance, on software licensing agreements, well, the parties may agree to uh, you know identify an attorney who works in the software field uh, so that, you know, they have a, a basic understanding of what's going on. So they don't have to, the parties don't have to spend time trying to <laughs> educate a judge on the finer points of software licensing. Um, but that's the general idea. Now, businesses want to go to mandatory arbitration because judges and attorneys who act as arbitrators are not going to be influenced by emotion. And they're also typically going to be recept more receptive to technical legal arguments. Uh, I'll give you a quick example. Uh, about 20 years ago, I used to defend uh, physicians and hospitals in medical malpractice cases. And I had one case where uh, somehow we ended up in arbitration. I don't even remember how. Um, I'm not sure why the plaintiff ever agreed to it. Uh, but the arbitration uh, was focused on the damages. So we had admitted that malpractice had occurred. There just wasn't any way around that. And so instead of letting uh, the trier of fact, the person who was going to decide the case, get all fired up by the evidence of the malpractice. We just said, yes, it happened. The only issue here are the damages. And it turned out that the person who was testifying about her damages um, had kept a notebook about all the pain and suffering and everything else. And the notebook was actually written by somebody else. Now, from a technical legal aspect, that makes it what's some, uh, something called hearsay. And so I objected and said, Your Honor, uh, this is hearsay, and it should not be admitted as evidence. And the court agreed. <laughs> well, not the court, the arbitrator agreed and uh, essentially took the notebook away from the person. And she couldn't really testify as to her pain and suffering. The more I asked questions, the more it became apparent she was just, you know, she just didn't have much to say. You know, my, my hand hurts. <laughs> and it was very unconvincing. Her attorney was irate. Uh, and we prevailed. Uh, you know, she was awarded damages, but it was very low amount, low, uh, lower even than we had estimated going in. You know, here's the range we think of damages that could be awarded. It was well below that. And so technically it was, you know, from our perspective, a victory, even though we had to pay out some money, wasn't a huge amount. So that's basically why businesses want to go to arbitration. There's, you know, a much more uh, technical uh, work through of whatever the dispute is. Now, the question then that has existed in the United States for a long time is, um, can businesses force consumers to give up their trial rights? Can a business include a clause uh, in a uh, receipt or in terms of conditions or license or you know, whatever it is uh, that goes along with a, a sale to a consumer that says, if you are unhappy with us, if you want to bring a legal action against us, you have to do it in arbitration. You cannot do it in a trial uh, setting. 
And the Supreme Court never really decided that issue. It just kept ignoring it um, for years and years and years. And so what happened was we had a default to the states. And so states decided their own cases and set their, you know, set their own precedent. Um, you know, some even passed some legislation on the issue. And nearly every state said, no, businesses cannot do this. It's taking away consumers' rights. And thus we moved forward, and that was kind of the standard. Now, in, around 2005 or so, we started to see changes on the United States Supreme Court. And uh, we'd had a liberal majority for quite some time. Liberals uh, tend to be more favorable to consumers, and a conservative majority in the Supreme Court tends to be more favorable to businesses. And so as the majority was flipped to conservatives, uh, large corporations started including mandatory arbitration clauses in their their agreements with con uh, consumers, even though they knew that they probably would get struck down in state court, uh, but they wanted to start um, essentially uh, appealing these up to the U.S. Supreme Court, trying to get the court to take one of these cases and see what the conservative majority had to say about it. So sure enough, uh, eventually the Supreme Court did that in a case called AT&T Mobility versus Concepcion. Uh, you can see the citation there uh, under number two uh, on the screen. And this was a case where the Exceptions had, I believe, purchased a, uh, it was either a mobile phone service or the mobile phones themselves, and a dispute arose, and AT&T Mobility had included a mandatory arbitration clause in the documentation when the purchase was made, and so they had this big debate. And the court said, yes, AT&T Mobility and any business uh, can force uh, consumers to go to mandatory arbitration and give up their trial rights. And that all the state law that has been developed on this issue uh, over the last however many years, 80 years, uh, is void. <laughs> We're ignoring it. It is no longer good law. And the reason for that is that there is a federal law that trumps, uh, no pun intended, um, the state laws. And that federal law is the United States Arbitration Act. That's also known as the Federal Arbitration Act. Now, the interesting thing about the Federal Arbitration Act is uh, is rarely cited for this purpose. It, it has rarely been uh, argued as being a basis for uh, essentially wiping out consumer rights. And in fact, the <laughs> Federal Arbitration Act was enacted in 1925. So we're not talking about a cutting edge law here. This law had been around forever and it had never, ever been accepted by uh, the Supreme Court as a basis for eliminating consumer rights. Uh, but in AT&T Mobility, Versus Concepcion, that change. Now, the other interesting aspect of the case is the Supreme Court noted that uh, businesses could also force uh, consumers to waive their right to class uh, be a part of a class action lawsuit. Now, class action lawsuits are important in the consumer market, the consumer legal market, because uh, many of the laws that are out uh, typically will include statutory damage provisions that are very low. So in the California Consumer Privacy Act, for instance, uh, if a data breach occurs, an individual affected by that uh, can bring a private right of action, which is a lawsuit in trial, uh, for damages, claiming damages between $100 and $750. Now, let's think about Equifax. Equifax had their huge, huge uh, uh, data breach, you know, millions of people impacted. How many of those people do you think would walk down to small claims court and file a lawsuit against Equifax uh, claiming $100 to $750 in damages? Number is going to be pretty low. Uh, it's just not, you know, it's not enough money that people are going to get off their rear end and go do it. Um, but if you allow for a class action lawsuit, what is happening there is uh, a group of people that all have the same claim against the same company uh, in the same event and the same potential damages can group together as one group and bring one giant lawsuit. And you tend to get a higher class of attorney bringing that lawsuit because there's more money involved. Um, and they bring the lawsuit and that has, uh, is a way for consumers to express their rights. Because if you have, let's say in the actual facts case, let's say a hundred thousand people are part of the class action. Well, if that was brought in the CCPA and each one of those people had suffered damages between 100 and $750 times a hundred thousand people, you can see that the money, the dollar figures become much higher and suddenly everybody's interested. So, uh, when at t Mobility said that businesses could force consumers to waive that right, uh, well, you know what businesses started doing and what I started doing with most of my clients <laughs> is including uh, our mandatory arbitration and class action waiver clauses in the terms and conditions of all my clients' websites uh, and apps. They really should be there as long as you can bind them to the terms and conditions. Um, but 
it, it was an incredible ruling. And this is kind of the power of, uh, you know, the Supreme Court changing from a liberal to a majority, a conservative majority, or if it had changed the other way. I know people like to get fired up about the hot button topics like abortion and guns rights and things of that sort. Um, but in reality, it's it's typically a lot of these uh, other subjects that maybe aren't nearly as sexy or interesting uh, that have the actual bigger effect on society. And so we are going through a period now where consumer rights are being curtailed and businesses are giving mu- being given much more reign to go out and do whatever they want. Um, now, you might think that's a good thing if you're a business owner, or you might think that's a bad thing if you're not a business owner. Uh, so what does any of this have to do with the CCPA? Well, it has to do with a provision in the CCPA that is rather interesting. Now, remember, if we're going to, as a business, require consumers to give up their trial rights, we're going to have to have language in a contract with them. Now, that contract may be a software license agreement, maybe the website terms and conditions, uh, you know, maybe anything. Uh, if you, you know, you order cable TV into your home, and you know you you check a box typically when you're ordering it agreeing to you know the cost and some other boilerplate provisions well those boilerplate provisions <laughs> include a mandatory arbitration clause and class action waiver now in the ccpa uh the california legislature did something interesting and you can see it there at number three on the video they included section 1798.192 which says any provision of a contract or agreement of any kind that purports to waive or limit in any way a consumer's rights under this title including but not limited to any right to a remedy or means of enforcement shall be deemed contrary to public policy and shall be void and unenforceable. Oh, Nelly. So what this is saying is that if you include uh, a clause in your agreement with your consumers, that says you're waiving your trial rights. Well, under this section of the CCPA, that's void. They're not going to allow you to enforce that clause. And so, as you can see, we have a conflict here. Uh, And the question is, well, which is going to prevail? The Supreme Court ruling in AT&T Mobility versus Concepcion or the CCPA clause? And uh, generally, when you have a federal law or federal court ruling on a particular subject that says one thing, and a state tries to pass a law on that same subject that that conflicts with that uh, federal ruling, uh, well, the federal court's going to (laughs) win. The Supreme Court sets the law of the land uh, on these types of issues, and so my expectation is that this, this provision of the CCPA is dead on arrival. Now, unfortunately, it's going to take five or six or seven years or however long, uh, you know, for this to be litigated because, you know, somebody's going to claim this in a lawsuit and a company's going to fight it and the courts will make a decision and then it's going to be appealed and appealed and it's going to take time before we know the exact answer. Um, but it's not looking good for the CCPA in this this area. And the interesting aspect of that is that the CCPA has a very limited private right of action. Basically, consumers can only file lawsuits uh, or bring individual private claims if there's a data breach. And um, so if there's, uh, you know, that type of situation and they're going to bring a class action lawsuit for that data breach, well, if they can't bring a class action lawsuit because of AT&T mobility, then the the consumer private right of action under the CCPA is, for all practical purposes, void. You know, some people might go down and file, you know, a a small claims court action, but not very many. Uh, And the attorneys are not going to pursue that because there's just not really going to be much, uh, you know, much interest in doing that. I mean, is somebody really going to want to go to arbitration for, you know, 500 bucks? Is an attorney going to want to take that? Well, attorneys charge, you know, many hundred dollars an hour. So the math doesn't really work there. Uh, And so it it has that kind of an impact. Now, there's still going to be enforcement actions by the California Attorney General. So I'm not suggesting in any way, shape or form that you shouldn't comply with the CCPA. You should. And frankly, you should do it anyways, regardless of this issue, just because there's probably going to be a national privacy law in the United States within the next two or three years. And it'll probably be something similar to the CCPA. So if you go ahead and comply now, you know, you'll be ready when that national privacy law comes out and it won't be a complete nightmare. Um, but nonetheless, it is a fascinating situation. And it also shows you um, when people come out and they start saying what a great thing the CCPA is, they don't really know what they're talking about. <laughs> it's it's There are many provisions of the CCPA that make very little sense. There are many provisions that are extremely uh, vague. Uh, and it's going to be a act that ends up uh, getting challenged in court right and left. Uh, but on the issue of mandatory arbitration, uh, particularly if you're a business owner or if you're an attorney who's trying to, you know, 
evaluate the risks associated with the CCPA and potential strategies for dealing with it, focusing on the conflict uh, between at and mobility versus Concepcion uh, and Section 1798.192 can be quite illuminating. So if you have questions about the CCPA or you need help complying with it, feel free to contact me at SoCalInternetLawyer.com. Uh, you can just look me up online, Richard Chapo. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, you can post them below. Please don't post anything that is confidential or sensitive since it's a public forum. Uh, if you enjoyed the video, give me a thumbs up. If you did not, I feel shame. Give me a thumbs down. Uh, we actually have a playlist on our YouTube page as well devoted to uh, the CCPA in its entirety. You'll find 30 or 40 videos there. Uh, so if you have questions, you may well be able to find answers there as well. Uh, anyways, thank you for watching. Have yourself a good one.